Today, is leverage in question now? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and prop news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Recently, Archie Goss Capital Management hit the headlines for all the wrong reasons. And I had several followers ask me to make a show about this. So today I'm going to do just that. And we ask whether this is a one-off event or is it a signal of a wider issue? So first, some background information. Archios Capital Management is a family office, which is speculated to have managed anywhere between five and fifteen billion dollars, or possibly more. A family office is a loosely regulated, privately owned company that manages vast amounts of money for wealthy clans. That said, the classification of a firm as a family office would be different depending on who's asking. But it is any firm that is investing money directly on behalf of the ultimate principal as compared to hedge funds, pension funds, endowments and other institutions. Family offices are not pooling third party capital and then investing. They're operating with a single or multiple set of family assets. Some suggest that there is a hundred million dollar net worth threshold as the point in which someone could potentially have a family office. According to a 2018 Credit Suisse report, globally there are around 50,200 individuals who have a net worth greater than 100 million US dollars. Many of these individuals manage their net worth within their firms. Many pool their assets to create multifamily offices and many are different branches of the same family. As such, Credit Suisse estimates that there's somewhere between 6,500 and 10,500 such entities, but no one really knows. Families usually need at least $500 million to set up a full service office with an investment staff. These entities are covert, private, and so are able to build enormous and risky positions without ringing alarm bells. According to UBS, 68% of the family office surveyed were founded in 2000 or later. The rise is explained by the fact that wealthy individual families have discovered they can operate at a significantly lower cost than the traditional vehicles accessible to them, while maintaining strong performance and in the past, wealthy individuals would have been funneled into institutional investment funds that would have often charged significant management fees. On the other hand, the 360 family office surveyed paid on average just 1.17% in total costs, including all operational, administrative and performance related costs. So in summary, family offices are covert, cost effective and actually sometimes multi-generational. Now with that out of the way, Let's get back to Archigos Capital Management, which is run by Bill Huang. Now, Bill Huang didn't always run a family office. Before that, he founded a hedge fund called Tiger Asset Management. But after the SEC charged him with insider trading and stock manipulation, to which he pleaded guilty, he closed the fund and paid a small fine of $44 million. Then in 2013, from the ashes of that running with the SEC, he started a family office called Archicos Capital Management and last April the SEC lifted a ban on him working at or running a securities firm. Though the ruling was little noticed at the time, it actually raises questions as to whether the one-time star hedge fund trader was plotting some sort of comeback. Historically, family offices have not had to be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission because of an exemption for firms with 15 clients or fewer. The Dodge-Frank Act, which tightened regulation in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, removed this exemption to shed more light on the hedge fund industry. But the SEC let family offices decide for themselves whether they should be registered and file regular reports. A search for Argicus on the SEC's Edgar reporting system yields, well, pretty much nothing which itself is eye-catching. Its use of financial derivatives known as swaps to build positions might have allowed it to circumvent 
reporting requirements on big stakes. The key ingredient of this new fund would be leverage, according to Bloomberg. Traders familiar with his orders describe Huang running a long, short strategy with exceptionally large leverage. Huang's family office built positions in at least nine stocks that were big enough to rank him among the largest holders, fueled by a level of bank leverage that would have been unusual even for a hedge fund, according to some reports. A key component of his strategy was the use of something called total return swaps, or TRS, which is a leveraged instrument. A total return swap is an agreement in which an investor, say a hedge fund, pays a set rate, for example LIBOR, to another party, which in exchange makes payments based on the return income and capital gain of an underlying asset it owns, like a stock. If the asset depreciates, the investor must cover the loss. Under this agreement, a firm like Archegos would make payments at a fixed or variable rate to its banks, and in return the banks would make payments to a firm like, like Archegos correlated to the return of a particular asset or assets. In this particular case, those payments ought to have been correlated to a basket of shares. Articus was able to build sizable stakes in companies without the market knowing because the assets were held on the books of its brokers. The structure of a TRS meant that regulators weren't aware of their true exposure levels. Beyond that, reports have begun to filter out that Articus also made use of contracts for difference or CFDs, another leverage product. A contracts for difference is another financial product that allows someone to make a bet on the direction of stocks, currencies or commodities without owning them. Investors used borrowed money or leverage to magnify the size of their bets. This is another of the tools Articus was thought to have used that obscured its accumulation of significant stakes in companies. Exactly how leveraged the fund was overall through its use of a combination of instruments remains, well, frankly unclear. The business standard pegged Huang's total exposure at around $50 billion, but the key elements were leverage, meaning a one-to-many relationship to an underlying asset, opacity, and a lack of regulatory oversight. Those who remember the GFC might also recall similar issues coming to light. But in any case, it appears that Archegos accumulated significant market positions across its prime brokers in just a handful of US and Asia-Pacific-based public companies, some of whose share prices recently declined suddenly and significantly after a substantial rise in the preceding months. And substantially leveraging its positions using total return swaps and other derivatives, as we discussed. Now, as Moody highlights, prime brokerage is an operationally intensive and at times balance sheet intensive business that has been run typically with a very low tolerance for risk. Prime brokers manage risk by setting advance rates or initial margins that account for the concentrations, liquidity and volatility of the collateral financed, as well as potential exposure on derivative positions. Margin requirements are then updated at least daily, with same-day variation margin calls made as necessary. Contractual terms of prime brokerage agreements allow a bank to declare a client in default and seize collateral in the event that variation margin calls are not met. And once a prime brokerage client is declared in default at one bank, cross-default provisions allow other prime brokers to also declare the client in default. But one central challenge for prime brokers is the opacity of client positions held at other prime brokers, making it difficult to ascertain the client's overall financial well-being and exposures. This risk is magnified in the case of likely regulated clients without substantial public financial reporting requirements, which appears to have been the case at Archegos. Prime brokers can manage such risks indirectly by requiring elevated margin postings and frequently refreshing these requirements based on changes in the value and risk of their clients' holdings and broader market considerations. However, the volatile financial market conditions since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic can make such margin requirements more difficult to gauge and monitor. Also, prime brokerage is a business in which many firms may compete on the terms they offer to clients. It is often prime brokers with the most extensive knowledge, experience and relationships in the underlying financial markets that fare better when required to react quickly to unusual events. 
Arctic Gas had particularly concentrated positions in media and US listed Chinese technology stocks, including Viacom, Discovery, Baidu, GSX, and Tencent Music. Real problems started when some of these stocks began to decline. Take Viacom, for example. The stock was trading around its 52 week highs Tuesday before last at around $95 per share. Great for Argigos. As reports suggest, they'd leveraged exposure to a name that had gone up and up. In fact, over the last six months, the Viacom share price had more than tripled. Then, on Wednesday before last, the giant media announced it was looking to raise between $2.65 billion and $3.06 billion. The offering had two parts, selling 20 million common shares at $85 a share and 10 million preferred shares at $100 a share. The company said it would use the funds raised for general corporate purposes, while also highlighting its intention to invest more aggressively in streaming services. Regardless of what you make of that rise, the market didn't like it. On the day of the announcement, the stock opened at $84.40 a share before closing just above $70 a share on significantly elevated volumes with 89.8 million shares traded during the session. There was less of a frenzy the next day, but the stock continued to slide, closing at $66.35 per share with 44.2 million shares trading during the session. Tencent Music also had faced selling pressure before last Friday week's event, and Baidu was trading lower as well. With some of Huang's big bets slipping, Archigos was hit with a margin call from its prime brokers. Now, a margin call means by using borrowed money by trading on margin, investors can ratchet up their gains from a transaction or their losses. The brokers or banks who finance that leverage require a deposit that can be increased if the value of the asset in question falls. A demand for increased collateral is known as a margin call. One of the greatest margin calls of all time on Archigos led to the liquidation of more than $24 billion in stocks, ranging from Chinese technology firms to US media giants. And when you're hit with a margin call, you can either deposit additional cash, liquidate unmargined securities, or sell your stocks. Now, Articos couldn't meet its margin call. So, global investment banks gathered in a hastily arranged call seeking a swift truce to deal with the issue, aiming to head off billions of dollars of losses in banks and a potential chain reaction across markets. Emirates from several of the world's biggest prime brokerages tried to head off the chaos by holding a call with Hoang before the drama spilled into the public view just a week ago. The idea, pushed by Credit Suisse, was to reach some sort of temporary standstill to figure out how to untie positions without sparking panic. Yet, clearly, just over a week ago, it was everyone for themselves. While block trades are common, the size of Archie's positions and their disposals rocked the market. As a $20 billion selling spree gained momentum, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley led the way. Other banks were left to follow, selling positions at a potential disadvantage. Block trades, by the way, are large securities transactions that are often negotiated outside of public markets or in so-called dark pools to avoid driving prices up or down in the course of executing the trade. A flurry of supersized block trades in companies such as Viacom signalled that troubles were afoot. The fourth liquidation that sent bellwether stocks tumbling was precedented by bickering in the highest rungs of international finance that quickly devolved into finger pointing and now fury. So this led to intense selling pressure Friday week in a number of the names that Archigos had taken concentrated positions in. Viacom saw its share price crash 27%, with 211.9 million shares trading hands. For reference, Viacom's average trade volume is around 24 million. Discovery also crashed 27% Friday week on elevated volumes. And one of the worst performing stocks embroiled in the Archica saga was GSX TechU, which has now collapsed 61% in the last few days. The Articles default and the likely losses incurred by entities like Credit Suisse and Nomura highlight the inherent credit negative risks and opacities associated with banks' prime brokerage services, particularly when those services are provided to lightly regulated entities with very little financial disclosure. And that's true also of the so-called Tiger Club. 
Tiger Management offshoot. The potential financial hit from Archegos exposure is sizable. Credit Suisse said the loss it will occur from its exit could be highly significant and material in its first quarter results. The bank's plans to buy back 1.5 billion Swiss franc or 1.6 billion dollar of shares are at risk, according to analysts. Estimates are that the lender could face losses of 3 billion to 4 billion US. The hits just keep coming for Credit Suisse, the analyst wrote in a note. Proceeding the Archer's losses were the liquidation of its supply chain of finance funds linked to collapsed financial debt Greensill and a write down on a stake in hedge fund York Capital Management taken in the fourth quarter. In fact, S&P Global Ratings downgraded its outlook on all Credit Suisse Group AG entities to negative from stable, citing its exposure to the Archegos capital management crisis. Numura estimated the amount of its claim against Archegos is nearly $2 billion based on prices as of the 26th of March. And other entities have made statements on their relationship too. Both Mitsubishi UFJ Securities Holdings Co. and Wells Fargo and Company. Mitsubishi said that an event at a European subsidiary in relation to a US client could lead to a financial loss of around $300 million. Wells Fargo said, we had a prime brokerage relationship with Archgos. We were well collateralized at all times over the last week and no longer have any exposure. In fact, five block trades valued around $2.14 billion were executed by Wells Fargo, according to Bloomberg. The bank solicited interest from investors in $18 million Viacom shares at $48 apiece before the market opened on Monday week. But standing back, it's still unclear exactly what Archegos Capital fits into the annals of spectacular hedge fund blow-ups. But the early signs are that it will probably prove the biggest since long-term capital management collapsed back in 1998. In LTCM's infamous blow-up in 1998, the fund adeptly took advantage of Wall Street's hunger for fees to play banks up against each other and get access to hefty leverage from each of them and each unaware of their rivals' true exposure. But at least LTCM was at the time the biggest hedge fund in the world, founded by storied Solomon Brothers traders, and advised by Noble Laureates. Aside from the underappreciated size of Archegos and the fat fees it probably paid to prime brokers, the fund and Hawang are essentially non-entities on Wall Street. Still, here are some questions to ponder. First and foremost, what on earth were some of the world's biggest investment banks thinking when they enabled an opaque family office whose founder had a history of regulatory issues to rack up multi-billion dollars worth of leverage? In fact, in 2014, he was banned from trading in Hong Kong. Now, of course, the status as a family office means that it's exempt from a lot of the standard regulatory disclosures demanded from hedge funds. But banks' prime brokerage desks, which service hedge funds with research trading structures and leverage, appear to have well, failed basic know-your-customer processes. Each bank may have felt comfortable with their exposure to Archegos, assuming they could always ditch its position to cover themselves, but they failed to appreciate that if anyone was to dump tens of billions of dollars worth of equities, the collateral they may have embedded in their contracts is going to be wholly inadequate. But finally, and perhaps more importantly, can the Archegos blow-up trigger a wider financial conflagration, such as LTCM did two decades ago? Well, probably not, with some caveats. LTCM was far bigger, more woven into the fabric of several systemically important markets. The Archegos losses will be humiliating to many banks and in some cases ruin their financial year, but they are much better capitalised than they were back in 2008. That said, there is a danger that a debacle of this magnitude encourages the entire investment banking industry to scale back how much leverage they offer their hedge fund clients. And if so, then the forced liquidation of an isolated gung-ho investment group could become a snowball that triggers a broader hedge fund deleveraging. But for now, markets are taking the debacle in their stride, but that could still change. In fact, JP Morgan estimated last week that the global bank losses could be around 10 
billion US dollars, well beyond normal unwinding scenarios for the industry. And the US Exchange and Securities Commission said that it was monitoring the situation, but hasn't really said much since. The fallout from Archicot's capital margin calls appear to be contained, but the regulatory scrutiny will not go away any time soon, wrote Edmund Mayo, senior market analyst at New York Auto. Every prime brokerage is looking at their books and could start pressurising family offices or hedge funds to bring down the leverage they're using. Moyer said the policymakers would likely seek assurances that banks would not coordinate with other brokerages on client trades, which could breach antitrust laws. It's not the first time in recent months that banks have been stung from lending to their richest clients. Last year, like in Coffee, Inc., defaulted on $518 million of margin loans, while the pandemic sell-off led to some brokers forcing their clients to put up more collateral against their existing debt. More than 10% of the world's 500 richest people have committed stock for a combined $163 billion, according to analysts from Bloomberg. That represents almost a fifth of their public holdings, up from about $38 billion four years ago, and double the pledges after last year's market bottom in March, when 40 of the wealthiest had pledges shared. Since the COVID outbreak, central banks in different countries have been providing liquidity, so banks and brokers are more likely to lend more money to their wealthy clients to keep the business, says Kenny Nunn, a securities treasurer at Everbright Sung Hung in Hong Kong. For the ultra-rich, committing shares is common practice, and with tens of millions of dollars in fees at stake, it's hard for banks to say no to a practice that typically has plenty of safeguards in place and represents only a fraction of the value of the pledge shares. Committed stock is especially common in Asia, where state-owned banks dominate financial markets and high-growth companies need to find different sources of funding. In mainland China, where top shareholders in initial public offerings typically have their stakes locked in for 36 months, the practice can help them get liquidity while maintaining their voting rights. Along with China, Japan and India require pledges to disclose their activity in a timely manner to keep track of the possible risks in the market, although that's not true for most countries. Public companies in the US are required to annually disclose any hedging of the firm's shares by directors or senior executives. Most large companies ban the practice. In a bull market, share pledging can make the bets more lucrative. When the value of a stake goes up, the investor might be able to ask for additional loans to buy more stocks, but the risks are also doubling when the market turns volatile. The speed at which Argos fell into trouble and Wall Street's swiftness in liquidating its position sent shockwaves across capital markets and has prompted regulators in the US to summon banks to get to the bottom of one of the biggest fund blow-up in years. But others say there's a lot of overheated rhetoric wafting about at the moment because margin calls is an everyday story on Wall Street, even if writ large. It's not a disaster that should worry regulators or anyone outside of Articos and its lenders. The fund was not over leveraged, they say, and its risk was not hidden. We may find that additional details, but from what we currently know, there's no reason to assume this was more than a losing trade by a very rich person. One reason many seem to be overreacting is because of reports that Articos approximately $10 billion of capital, basically Hoang's net worth, supported $50 billion to $100 billion of market positions. These figures, if accurate, are gross notional leverage, which adds together the notional value of the fund's long and short positions. If Articos borrowed $40 billion to buy $50 billion of one stock, that would be a lot of leverage. A 20% down move, not uncommon in individual stocks, could reduce the fund's capital to zero and threaten its lenders and losses. But no prime broker would lend 80% of the purchase price of a single stock, when typically ran dollar neutral portfolios equal amounts long and short. A portfolio that is long 25 billion in stocks and short 25 billion can be much safer than one holding 10 billion of unleveraged stock. Lending $40 billion against such a portfolio might be prudent. Although we don't know for sure, reports and Hoang's history suggest that his long positions were concentrated in about 10 stocks, while his shorts were more diversified, perhaps even among index hedges. In that case, the perfect storm would be that all his long positions have their largest down moves in history at the same time as the market 
as the hole goes up. Lenders that don't lose money in perfect storms are taking zero risk, which is generally not the optimal business solution. Granted, some of this perfect storm was self-reinforcing, with missed margin calls leading to selling that pushed prices lower, leading to even more selling, but people are exaggerating the direct effect of the Articus margin calls. Given the size and liquidity of the stocks relative to Articus position, there were likely fundamental forces at work as well as other investors in the same positions Articus and opportunists selling ahead of the selling they expect from others. Another popular misunderstanding is that Articus' use of swaps hid the risk from creditors and regulators. There are two main ways hedge funds get leveraged to buy stocks. The first is to buy the stocks in a prime brokerage account and borrow some of the purchase price from the broker. The second is to enter into a total return swap in which the broker buys the stock and the fund agrees to pay any losses on the position in return for receiving any gains. These are virtually identically economically and pose the same risk to the prime broker. In fact, funds often buy stocks and only later instruct the prime broker whether to hold the shares in the brokerage accounts or in a swap. In both cases, the broker is holding margin cash from the fund as well as the shares. If the shares decline in value, the fund must post more margin or the broker will sell the shares and keep the margin to repay the loan. It sometimes happens that shares fall so far and so fast in price that the prime broker loses money and the fund lacks the cash to make good. That's a risk of the hugely profitable $30 billion of revenue in 2020 prime brokerage businesses. We are seeing reports that two prime brokers lost around $2 billion, which is an exceptional amount, but we don't know the whole story. Some of those losses may be indirect, such as losses from the firm's own positions. Perhaps the firm's accepted inadequate margins for Archigo's risk level, which happens sometimes when firms are anxious to grow business. But the capital rules here are quite strict and any losses will be felt by bank shareholders. The financial system and bank creditors are not at risk. These are internal risk management issues for banks and nothing to worry anyone who doesn't own their stocks. Although some banks may have made unfortunate decisions, it's not true this risk was hidden or that there are no good systems to manage the risks. The first line of defence is the credit departments, which must approve all counterparties. These analysts had full insight into Archicus Capital's position, position sizes, risk management processes, strategy and other factors. The credit department is not allowed to share this information with traders or prime brokerage staff, but it does examine this information carefully before approval and monitors it rigorously afterwards. Next, the stock positions are on banks' books and are subject to extensive risk management oversight as part of the vast portfolio of long and short equity positions held. There are sophisticated quantitative models, stress tests, and careful attention by the bank's traders who know the price and liquidity situation of each name constantly. Mistakes are made, money is lost, but not for a lack of attention or knowledge. And finally, regulators insist that large capital buffers are held to cover losses. However optimistic the prime brokerage managers were, and however aggressively they shaved margin requirements to win business, they had no control over the minimum capital needed to ensure that even in extreme events, losses were limited to bank shareholders and could not spill over to the broader financial system. Not every credit loss is a mistake or a disaster. They are a natural part of the financial system. Other than the amounts involved, the Articus collapse is nothing unusual. One has a reason to be depressed, and some of the Wall Street banks may be looking at pink slips, but the rest of us can go about our businesses unconcerned. But I want to make a broader point. This does highlight the issue of leverage and over-leverage. And I think this example, and indeed Greensill Capital, are both examples of organisations that were allowed to be massively leveraged, and I still think over-leveraged. And I'm not sure that the checks and balances and systems and processes that we have across the financial markets, particularly at a time of massive liquidity creation, are sufficient. So my own view is we may well see more casualties more people getting caught out as markets move, and that leverage ahead might start to get tightened. And it's that reinforcing tightening which may actually create more issues later. So we'll have to watch and see. But I wonder whether this does signal 
a change in trajectory of future leverage. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.